Hello, and welcome to part three of the RSET webinar, Satellite Remote Sensing for Agricultural Applications. My name is Sean McCartney, and I'm an Earth scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. In part three of the webinar series, we'll be focusing on Earth observations for agricultural monitoring. In part one of the webinar series, we provided a history of Earth observations for agriculture and highlighted satellites and sensors and their applications for agriculture, as well as how to access these data products. We discussed the caveats and limitations of remote sensing and introduced the NASA Harvest Program. In part two of the webinar series, we focused on soil moisture using NASA satellite observations and modeled products that provide critical information for drought monitoring, agricultural monitoring, and crop forecasting. Both the SMAP mission and land data assimilation systems were covered. In today's webinar, we'll highlight previous RSET trainings with agricultural applications, cover some of the main products and variables for cropland and rangeland monitoring, and showcase operational agricultural monitoring and early warning systems. As with previous sessions, each webinar in the series will have a one-hour presentation followed by a 30-minute question-and-answer session. The homework assignments for parts one and three are both available on the RSET website. The link to the training page is provided below. Part three homework covers material from the second and third week of the webinar series. Answers must be submitted via Google Form with due dates of April 28th for homework one and May 12th for homework two. If you are interested in a certificate of completion, you must attend all the webinars and complete all homework assignments. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the, of the course from Marines Martin. The prerequisite for this webinar series is the Fundamentals of Remote Sensing, sessions one and two A. Both sessions are found on the RSET website and from the link below. For those new to remote sensing, we strongly recommend going through the fundamental series to provide a theoretical foundation for all the RSET webinars. The Fundamentals of Remote Sensing webinars are available for viewing at any time, providing basic information about satellite orbits, types, resolutions, sensors, processing levels, and specific applications. By the end of today's presentation, attendees will be able to select some of the main products and variables used in agricultural monitoring, identify sources for timely and accurate agricultural statistics and assessment, give examples of global operational agricultural monitoring systems for crop condition, assessment, and early warning, and explore some of the agricultural monitoring systems that can be applied to your own area of interest. The outline of today's presentation is as follows. We will first highlight previous RSET trainings freely available on our website and through YouTube with useful agricultural applications. We'll give an overview of some of the main products and variables for cropland and rangeland monitoring. We will highlight USDA's National Agricultural Statistics Service, or NAS, for timely and accurate agricultural statistics for the United States and showcase NASA's CropScape web application for exploring and downloading annual cropland data. We'll provide examples of operational global agricultural monitoring systems, as well as examples of operational food security and early warning systems. It is well recognized that long-term precipitation measurements are necessary for understanding and monitoring regional precipitation characteristics. An RSET webinar held in January and February of this year focused on analysis and interpretation of the new long-term iMERGE precipitation data, focusing on extreme dry and wet period monitoring. The GPM satellite is a joint agency collaboration between NASA and JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency. It carries two of the most calibrated Earth-observing instruments, GMI and DPR. 
The GPM Core Observatory serves as both a calibration and an evaluation tool for all the passive microwave and infrared-based precipitation products integrated in iMERGE from a constellation of national and international satellites. This constellation of satellites with rain gauge data are used to derive iMERGE estimates for different phases of precipitation, solid, liquid, and mixed. iMERGE provides multiple runs for different user requirements for latency and accuracy. The early run is near real time is a near real time product with a four hour latency. The late run has a 14 hour latency and can be used for crop monitoring and forecasting. The final run is a post real time product with a three month latency. The final run is the research product which has the highest accuracy. The iMERGE reanalysis webinar focused on access and analysis of long-term iMERGE precipitation data for detection of dry and wet periods. Demonstrations and step-by-step -step instructions using open source software were provided to download iMERGE monthly and seasonal data. They were used to calculate time series statistics from iMERGE data, calculate the standardized precipitation index or SPI using Bash and Python. We then displayed and analyzed precipitation anomalies. And we finally analyzed socioeconomic data from NASA's Socioeconomic Data and Application Center, or CDAC, along with iMERGE precipitation data. A second RSET training we wish to draw your attention to is another advanced webinar. Synthetic Aperture Radar for Land Cover Applications. The second part of this webinar series focused on using freely available SAR data for crop identification and condition. Part two covered the basics of radar remote sensing as related to agriculture with a focus on the use of SAR to retrieve soil moisture, identify crop types, and map land cover. The webinar provided knowledge and applications on how SAR configurations affect response from soils and crops. The webinar provided information on the content in SAR images relevant to soil and crop conditions. Optimal sensor parameters for agricultural applications were discussed, as well as how to ingest, pre-process, and process multi-frequency SAR data for use in crop classification and soil moisture estimation. Finally, we showed how to implement the random forest algorithm in R to perform crop classification. Another webinar with applications to agricultural monitoring was creating and using normalized difference vegetation index or NDVI from satellite imagery. The webinar showed how to derive NDVI from Landsat imagery and open source software. It also demonstrated how to calculate NDVI anomalies using a time series of MODIS data. The NDVI webinar provided knowledge on NDVI calculation and applications, how to acquire, use, and derive NDVI imagery from Landsat and MODIS, how to use MODIS NDVI images to derive time series and NDVI anomaly maps, and how to visualize MODIS NDVI time series using the Global Inventory Modeling and Mapping Studies, or GIMS, Global Agricultural Monitoring Project. The GLAM system is funded through an interagency agreement between the USDA Foreign Agricultural Service and NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. We'll be learning more on how the GIMS GLAM project is supporting USDA's Foreign Agricultural Service later in the webinar. The last webinar I'll quickly highlight due to high interest from the user community is the introductory webinar, Introduction to Synthetic Aperture Radar. The webinar is bilingual 
in both Spanish and English. The multi-part webinar series focused on building the skills needed to acquire and understand SAR data, including polarimetric and interferometric SAR. We hope you will refer to each of these past RSET webinars to learn more about satellite remote sensing and how it can be applied for agricultural applications. We will now cover some of the main applications, products, and variables used for cropland and, mon and rangeland monitoring. As discussed in part one of the webinar series, agricultural monitoring was probably the first civilian application of satellite remote sensing data, starting with Landsat 1 when it launched in 1972. Remote sensing allows gathering information about the biophysical state of vegetation, such as leaf area index and photosynthetically fraction of active fraction of absorbed photosynthetically active radiation over large areas with a high revisit re frequency. Remote sensing provides timely, objective, local to global coverage. It contributes to the accurate and timely reporting of agricultural statistics and permits accurate forecasting of yield or shortfalls in crop production and food supply per region and country. This slide shows some of the main products and variables used for, for cropland and rangeland monitoring. In the following slides, we'll discuss each one in greater detail. Crop calendars are a fundamental component of agricultural production monitoring systems, since they help analysts to focus on the seasons when different crop types are actually growing in the field. In much of the world outside of the tropics, the growing season is limited by winter temperatures. The farther away from the equator your location, the less solar radiation is received, which shortens the growing season. In higher latitudes away from the tropics, cold temperatures of spring limit of spring limit the earliest opportunity to plant. A typical planting date is after the average last spring freeze. At the end of the growing season, the average first fall freeze limits growing season length. In some parts of the world, temperature are the controlling factor for the crop season, while in other areas, rains are the controlling factor. The crop calendar is the fundamental document of agricultural meteorology. Crop, cal ca crop calendars provide crop-specific key phenological timings, such as sowing, growing, and harvesting. Sources of crop calendars for major crops are made available at the national level by the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations and the United States Department of Agriculture. Vegetation indices such as NDVI are key data sources for assessing crop health, along with other important indicators such as soil moisture, evapotranspiration, and precipitation. NDVI is closely correlated with a plant's rate of photosynthesis and is therefore a reliable indicator of a crop's health. Vegetation indices are most effective beginning in the pre-peak season of crop growth and continuing through harvest for monitoring and yield prediction. They are not as applicable during the early stages of crop growth when the green leaf area is small as results are very sensitive to soil background effects. The analysis of crop condition is based on the comparison of the actual crop status to previous seasons or to what can be assumed to be the average or normal condition. This establishes normal growing conditions for the crops in a specific area. NDVI can also monitor pasture and rangeland conditions and productivity. Detected anomalies provide alternative measures of the relative vegetation health. Anomalies can be used to monitor the areas where vegetation may be stressed, such as a proxy to detect potential drought, or showing positive signals where crops or rangeland are at average or above average biomass for that period of the growing cycle.
Simply looking at a map of vegetation greenness can be misleading, partly because the data doesn't distinguish between planted crops and non-target vegetation. For this reason, identifying the exact areas where crops are growing, called crop masking, is a critical first step, as it is necessary to exclude results that stem from extraneous plants like trees and grass. Some ways of creating a crop mask are to identify the vegetation that follows the typical growth, crop growth cycle of the targeted crop for a given area. This can be determined by understanding the crop calendar and phenology of a crop derived through a time series of NDVI images. To differentiate between crops and trees, the easiest way is to calculate the mean NDVI value for each of the three months in the past year. The vegetated areas having high NDV values for more than three months in a row will most likely mean coniferous forest. Crops rarely maintain high NDVI this long. Crop masking is a critical early step for building yield models. Later in the webinar, we'll be showing examples where you can find reliable crop masks and acreage for the United States and other parts of the world. Crop type masking is similar to creating a crop mask with the stated goal of identifying specific crops within a region. By compiling satellite images of a given area, it's possible to determine where a specific crop is growing and where it is not growing. This can be determined by understanding the crop calendar and phenology of a crop derived again through a time series of NDVI images. In situ data is extremely important for the validation of crop type masking. If ground truth data is unavailable, research has proven an analog can be used in areas that do not have reliable data. Crop type masking is also a critical early step for building yield models. Another key variable for agricultural monitoring is evapotranspiration, which is the sum of evaporation from the land surface plus transpiration in vegetation. Some of the factors which determine transpiration rates are temperature, atmospheric moisture, wind, and soil moisture. Evapotranspiration, or ET, is highly variable in space and time. It is a critical component of the water and energy balance of climate, soil, vegetation interactions. ET is important for irrigation management, crop stress, yield prediction, and water productivity. Remote sensing has long been recognized as the most feasible means to provide provide spatially distributed regional evapotranspiration information over land surfaces. Next week, the entire webinar will be devoted to evapotranspiration, so please join us next Tuesday for the final part of this webinar series to learn more about ET. Another key variable in agricultural monitoring is the fraction of absorbed photosynthetically active radiation, or FAPAR. FAPAR quantifies the fraction of photosynthetically active radiation which is absorbed by vegetation canopy. <clears throat> it is a, a fraction of photosynthetically active radiation and it refers only to the green and alive elements of the canopy. It's suitable to, re to reliably monitor the seasonal cycle and interannual variability of vegetation activity related to photosynthesis, photosynthesis and can advantageously replace NDVI. Precipitation and temperature are two of the major factors that determine the proportion of photosynthetically uh, radiation absorbed by plants. It is an important parameter in measuring biomass production because vegetation development is related to the rate at which radiant energy is absorbed by vegetation. Major approaches to generating FAPAR from remotely sensed images include linear modeling, 
which attempt to relate reflectance data recorded by a sensor to field measurements of FAPAR using linear regression techniques. Another approach to generating FAPAR is a physical model, which used principles of how light energy is absorbed or reflected from different surfaces to estimate physical characteristics of vegetation, such as FAPAR. A last approach is to use artificial neural networks that are good at analyzing data from nonlinear and non-parametric systems. Growing degree days is a type of crop calendar popular in the mid-latitudes based on recent temperature conditions. Crop calendars show how much growth deviates from average. A crop may be a week ahead or behind at emergence and further off at anthesis, which marks the beginning of the reproductive stage of a crop. If growing degree days are used, one has an anticipation as to whether or not the crop will be ahead of schedule or behind the calendar schedule. For crop development or for pest development, temperature expressed as growing degree days is often the principal variable. Because insect development is dependent on growing degree days as much as crop development, farmers use growing degree days to time their application for pesticides at the point the pest is most vulnerable. Growing degrees are calculated each day as maximum temperature plus the minimum temperature divided by two, or the mean temperature, minus the base temperature. Growing degree days are accumulated by adding each day's growing degrees contribution as the season progresses. If the average temperature is below the base temperature, the growing degree day value for that day is zero. <clears throat> Use of growing degree days and accumulated growing degree days can improve phenological analyses and crop yield models. As growing degree days are linear approximation for the growth of a crop, a limitation of growing degrees are crops do not always follow a linear growth response with respect to temperature. They grow more according to a curve based on varying conditions. That being said, they still provide a good anticipation as to whether or not a crop will be ahead or behind the calendar schedule. Vegetation phenology <clears throat> is the description of periodic plant life cycle events across the growing season. Phenology is not a new science. The Chinese are accredited with keeping the first written phenological records, which date back to nearly 1000 BC. In Japan, accounts of when cherry tree blossoms were at their peak each year have been maintained for the, for the past 12 centuries. What is new is the application of satellite sensors to track phenological events. Satellites provide a unique perspective of the planet and allow for consistent, timely, monitoring of the entire global land surface. Phenology can be divided into vegetative or the emergence and green up stage and the reproductive stage, which is anthesis to senescence. Remote sensing phenology can reveal broad scale phenological trends that would be difficult, if not impossible, to detect, to detect from the ground. Remotely sensed phenological data are useful for assessing crop conditions, drought severity, and wildfire risk, as well as tracking invasive species, infectious diseases, and insect pests. Because phenological events are sensitive to climate variation, these data also represent a powerful tool for documenting phenological trends over time and detecting the impacts of climate change on ecosystems at multiple scales. Precipitation is a key component of the, water, of the water cycle and difficult to measure since rain and snow vary greatly in both space and time. Precipitation, or the lack thereof, is a key indicator for drought, water resource management, and food security. Satellites provide the timely 
objective measurements, especially where ground-based data are sparse. Satellite-derived precipitation estimates, such as from GPM iMERGE or CHIRPS, allow one to calculate precipitation anomalies, which provide information of average precipitation deviation from the long-term average over that same period. Precipitation anomalies help us to detect dry and wet areas compared to the long-term average. The timing and amount of precipitation is necessary to forecast crop yields as well as freshwater shortages. <clears throat> as we learned in last week's webinar, water is the defining link between climate and agriculture. To improve agricultural drought decision support systems and ensure food security, better quality and better use of soil moisture is vital. Soil moisture is also a key parameter in calculating evapotranspiration along with temperature, atmospheric moisture, and wind. The USDA Foreign Agricultural Services Global Crop Decision Support System has been enhanced by the integration of NASA SMAP soil moisture observations. The efforts have led to, to the generation of improved soil moisture information that is essential for the agency's crop forecasting activities. To learn more about soil moisture products for agriculture applications, please refer to part two of the webinar series. All biological and chemical processes taking place in the soil relate to air temperature. As discussed when talking about growing degree days, the heat supply of crops is characterized by a sum of average daily air temperatures that are higher than the biological minimum during a vegetation period. It is a key variable for agricultural monitoring and for the timing of planting and monitoring the phenological stages of plants. Temperature is used in agriculture and water resource management to allow farmers and decision makers to evaluate water requirements. Temperature is also one of the key parameters in calculating evapotranspiration, along with atmospheric moisture, wind, and soil moisture. Three distinct temperature points of growth are the following. Minimal temperature, which is enough for growth to start. Optimal temperature, which is the most advantageous for growth processes, and maximum temperature where growth stops. Vegetation indices are probably the most important of the satellite products for cropland and rangeland monitoring. By observing infrared light reflected from plants, vegetation indices such as NDVI can signal stresses in plant health, such as oncoming drought, as much as two weeks before problems are detected by the naked eye. NDVI is closely correlated with a plant's rate of photosynthesis and is therefore a reliable indicator of a crop's health. Vegetation indices are most effective beginning in the pre-peak season of crop growth and continuing through harvest for monitoring and yield prediction. The analysis of crop condition is based on the comparison of the actual crop status to previous seasons or to what can be assumed to be the average or normal condition. Anomaly maps of NDVI are routinely used to detect anomalous crop and rangeland development compared to what can be assumed to be the average or normal condition. The last variable we'll discuss for cropland monitoring is yield forecast. Yield model forecasts contain a variety of climate inputs, such as temperature and precipitation, along with evapotranspiration, soil moisture, and vegetation indices. Remote sensing performs a central role within statistical programs in the estimation of crop area and yields. Yield can be estimated either empirically or statistically with vegetation indices derived from satellite reflectance or mechanistically by combining remotely sensed green area index with process-based crop growth model. 
The main advantage of empirical estimation lies in its simplicity, but it comes at the cost of collecting ground data and is difficult to extrapolate in time and space. Mechanistic crop models are more comprehensive than statistical ones, but they are more complicated to design and operate depending on their degree of sophistication, as well as the spatial and temporal scales and resolutions over which they are intended to operate. You should expect that models claiming a wide range of applicability will remain fairly generic, while those dedicated to a particular crop or plant type may be much more specific and detailed. The next section focuses on USDA's National Agricultural Statistics Service, the most reliable source for agricultural data and statistics for the United States. We'll also showcase how to access annual data for major crops grown within the continental United States. In 1862, during the height of the American Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln signed the law that created the U.S. Department of Agriculture. By 1866, the Department of Agriculture began a regular reporting series on livestock numbers, monthly crop conditions, and final acreage, yield, and production estimates for principal crops. Weekly reports have been published since 1914 and standardized in 1985 to be comparable across states. In 1986, the Statistical Reporting Service was renamed the National Agricultural Statistics Service, and since 1995, all reports are available within five minutes of the release time from NASA's website. It would be hard to overestimate the importance of NASA's work or its contribution to government agencies who all rely heavily on the information provided by NASA. Each month, the U.S. Department of Agriculture publishes crop supply and demand estimates for the nation and the world. These estimates are used as benchmarks in the marketplace because of their comprehensive nature, objectivity, and timeliness. NAS conducts hundreds of surveys every year and prepares reports covering virtually every aspect of U.S. agriculture, from the region to the state, to the Agricultural Statistic dist Statistics District, to the county. They also conduct the Census of Agriculture every five years, providing the only source of consistent, comparable, and detailed agricultural data for every county in the United States. Since 2009, NASA has drawn on Landsat data to monitor dozens of crops in the, in the continental United States as part of the Cropland Data Layer Program. The Cropland Data, Cropland Data Layer, or CDL, is a raster, geo-referenced, crop-specific land cover layer created annually since 1997. In 2010, NAS launched Cropscape, a geospatial portal allowing interactive browsing and querying of the cropland data layer. The purpose was to use satellite imagery to provide acreage estimates to the Agricultural Statistics Board for major commodities. Cropscape is just one of several geospatial data products provided by NAS on their website. The following demo will show you how to access and download cropland data from NASA's Cropscape web portal. First, we'll go to the official website for USDA's National Agricultural Statistics Service. As this demo is focused on geospatial data, we encourage you to return to NASA's website and explore more of what data and statistics NASA offers. For geospatial data, we'll hover our cursor over the Data and Statistics tab. At the bottom of this drop-down, we can see geospatial data and interactive maps. It's there we will select the Cropscape link. Once we select the link, it will open, uh, the portal will open in a new tab. 
On the layers on the left hand side, you can see all the cropland data layer maps from 1997 to 2019. For the year 1997, the data was not quite complete. It was only uh, for the state of North Dakota. In subsequent years, data was expanded to the Midwest and Eastern states. It wasn't until 2008 that complete coverage for the continental United States was provided. Besides the cropland data layers for each year from 1997 to 2019, NAS also provides a crop mask layer, which is valid from 2015 to 2017, as well as crop frequency layers for the four major commodity crops of corn, soy, cotton, and wheat. They also provide administrative boundary layers, water layers, and road layers. The second tab is the legends tab, which provides a legend of all of the, the data layers, the crop data layers that are provided within the CDL. So for the year 2019, if I wanted to start querying the data set to be able to extract relevant information for an area that I was interested in, in this case, I will select the state of California. I'll do that by going up here and define the area of interest. You see I have four options. I can select from a region, a state, uh, an agricultural statistical district, or a county. In this case, I'll go with the state, and I will choose California. Once the data set finishes drawing, if I go up to the top of the toolbar and I can select Download Defined Area of Interest Data, you can see I can download multiple dates for this study for this uh, area of interest. I can also download a mask, a cropland mask for the state, as well as a frequency for the four major commodity crops within the state. Another way to query the data is to do it by county. In this case, I'll go back to the state of California, but I'll select Imperial County, which is along the Mexican border in Southern California, and one of the major uh, producing regions of the state. You can see in Imperial Valley, there's a, a lot of different crops that are being grown. If I want to con contrast it from a different year, I can go up to the toolbar and select the swipe tool and I can uh, I can swipe and compare the, the different data sets for different years. In this case I'll compare the year 2019 to the year 2016. I'll use this slide bar to be able to slide back and forth to compare the two years. On the left is the CDL for 2019 and on the right is the CDL for 2016. If I wanted to get, uh, if I wanted to get more statistics for uh, my study area, I can refine it even more by using the uh, by using the defined area of interest, which I can define on my own. In this case, I'm going to draw a circle and compute some statistics for the year 2019. I can look at it in a, uh, a tabular way, but then I can also look at it within a pie chart as well as a uh, bar chart. I can see that alfalfa uh, is the dominant crop grown in that year, and if I wanted to take a crop mask for that specific crop, I could select it and then go up to the export the selected crop for mapping. This is one way that you can get a crop mask for a specific crop for one year of your study of interest. You can also do this on the state level if you were interested in a specific crop at the state level as well. You can also uh, export tabular data as a CSV file. But in this case, I'm just going to go ahead and clear this out and zoom back out to the full extent.
This was a very quick demo to showcase the cropscape, but we hope that you'll come back to explore more of the geospatial portal for agricultural data and statistics on your own. The NAS is a very robust data set for all of the crops grown in the United States, within the continental United States, and can be used for validating models as well as creating crop masks to be able to uh, run models on your own. This next section shows examples of operational agricultural monitoring systems. Global and regional scale agricultural monitoring systems aim to provide up-to-date information regarding food production to decision makers. They help reduce vol price volatility and ensure the coordinated flow of information in a timely manner for early warning purposes. This chart highlights the eight main operational agricultural monitoring systems. All of them are used for decision support systems for early warning, and they all have a regional analysis, though only a handful are global operational systems by design. Websites for each of the monitoring systems are provided, though only four will be highlighted in this webinar. We encourage you to explore each of the websites on your own to learn more. The first operational agricultural monitoring system we'll explore is the International Production Assessment Division of the USDA's Foreign Agricultural Service. FAS is responsible for global crop production assessments and estimates of area, yield, and production for grains, oil, seeds, and cotton. The primary mission of IPAD is to produce the most objective and accurate assessment of global cultural, uh, agricultural production and the conditions affecting food security around the world. Regional analysts use remote sensing and geographic information systems to collect market intelligence and analyze near real-time satellite imagery to estimate global production. IPAD is divided into regions of responsibility with dedicated analysts overseeing objective and accurate assessments for each of the regions. From the home page, you can access current updates as well as commodity reports. iPad also pro provides crop calendars and production maps, and they provide this. They can provide this on a per country basis. In this case, I'll go down to Brazil, and we can see sorted by year the crops as well as the tonnage. Uh, for each of these crops, main commodity crops. We can also see where the crops are concentrated within each country in terms of production, as well as crop calendars for each of these major commodity crops. The same can be true for all the other countries of the world as well. Another useful tab is the geospatial tab. We'll be exploring two of these tools on this tab both the Crop Explorer as well as the Global Agriculture Disaster Assessment System. But it's good to know that you can explore some of the other ones, such as the Global Agricultural Monitoring, which is a, a web service put out by the Goddard Space Flight Center in collaboration with the United States Department of Agriculture, as well as other systems like the Tropical Cyclone Monitoring System, as well as some archived uh, data sets. A web service for global coverage is the Global Agricultural and Disaster Assessment System, or GATIS. GATIS is a powerful visualization tool based on an ArcGIS platform that enables FAS iPad analysts and other users to rapidly assess real-time crop conditions. The system integrates a vast array of highly detailed data streams that include daily precipitation, vegetation indices, crop masks, land cover data, irrigation and water data, elevation and infrastructure, political data, and much more. In addition, FAS iPad is partnered with the Pacific Disaster Center in Hawaii to incorporate real-time data streams into GATIS for worldwide monitoring, tracking, and pre- and post-disaster agricultural assessments. GATIS can be used for global agricultural monitoring and commodity forecasting. 
comparative climatic and satellite-derived vegetation analysis, drought monitoring, and natural disaster assessment analysis. The following demo will show you some of the important features for both FAS Crop Explorer and GATIS. First, we'll go to the Geospatial Data tab and we'll select Crop Explorer. The options presented are to explore your area of interest by region, or you can select it interactively on the map view. You also have the option to explore uh, different commodity crops by region, as well as some of the latest top stories and production briefs coming out of the Foreign Agricultural Service. In this case, I'm going to show how to explore some of the data products that are available in the South America region. When you first open up a region, it defaults to the NDVI page. This is showing the NDVI and the NDVI anomalies for both the Proba V as well as the uh, Modus Terra uh, sensors. It also shows crop masks and crop mass departure from average. If we go to the tabs on the left, we can see that we can peruse some of the meteorological data in terms of precipitation and temperature, both min and maxes. We also have an option for uh, visualizing some of the soil moisture. So in this case, we're looking at soil moisture anomalies for the past seven days. We can also go back further in time if we wanted to. And we can see that there is very low soil moisture uh, in far northern Argentina and Paraguay. The soil moisture products are derived both from the SMOS satellite mission, which is a European space agency, as well as SMAP, which we learned a lot about in week two of this webinar series. We can also look at drought severity for South America. And in this case, we're looking at the SPI, or the Standardized Precipitation Index. This is in effect a z-score uh, of what the current period of time, if it's one month or two months or what have you, and how that compares to all the same two months within the data record. So in this case, we're looking at a one-month standardized precipitation index derived from the CHIRPS data. And again, we're seeing some uh, very low level, so negative values for the SPI in the same region of Paraguay. The two-month uh, SPI is showing the same thing. And it looks like for the products that they create, the SPI goes up to 12 months. So this is very useful for looking at long-term meteorologic, meteorological drought versus, say, a uh, short-duration meteorological drought if it were only lasting for one month. Again, we can go back to the vegetation, and we can also select on the country, and then within the country, we can select different subregions to be able to see how the NDVI for that particular year compares to last year and then the average, and the average in this case being from 2000 until present. There's also an option to explore the data using satellite data, as well as looking at the growing season, uh, the most recent going back uh, several, several years of the growing season, and then additional resources for area yield and production, uh, commodity intelligence reports, crop production maps, so on and so forth. So this is just a brief overview of the Crop Explorer but I hope that you will all go back and explore on your own. For the sake of time, I'm going to highlight another geospatial portal, this time the Global Agricultural and Disaster Assessment System. This is a portal that was collaborated on between both the iPad uh, FAS as well as the Pacific Disaster Center, which is located in Hawaii. We can see there are a number of disasters. If we start clicking on them, we can see that there's an earthquake recently in Iceland, uh, a volcano in Russia. It looks like there's drought in Hawaii and, and storms blowing in from Brazil. 
So the Pacific Disaster Center tracks uh, global disasters worldwide so people can better prepare and become more resilient to these natural phenomena. I'm going to deselect a lot of the default layers that they have on. That way we can explore some of the other data sets that they offer. For instance, there's a number of different products for rainfall, such as total, percent, pre precipitation departure, average, and GFS rainfall forecast. We can also visualize temperature from the min and max, as well as the extreme and the average. We can also view snow depth and snow cover. If we want to explore NDVI anomalies, we can do that. In this case, I will zoom into a region of the Rift Valley. This is in Eastern Africa, uh, in, the, in the Great Rift Valley, uh, just around Lake Victoria. We can view different NDVI anomalies going back uh, 20 years, and we can also play a recording of them for a, a loop and animation. But for this case study, I'm going to look at the most recent NDVI anomaly to see how NDVI is, is uh, uh, in the most current eight-day period compared to uh, the record of all the NDVI for that same period going back. So if we go back one more, and if I use the legend, we can see that the NDVI values are quite high. So now if we want to do a little bit more exploratory, we can look at crop condition. And in this case, we'll look at, uh, we'll look at precipitation. So this will be uh, precipitation departure, and we'll use the chirps. And we can also see that precipitation uh, rates in this area have been much higher than the average, which would explain some of the greener vegetation at this time compared to other times. We can also explore other things such as uh, crop condition, you can use the SPI if you're wanting to uh, look at SPI at a certain time compared to uh, other environmental variables. Another feature that is useful to use is the tools where you can bring up satellite imagery. And in this case, I'm gonna deselect some of the layers that I just had on, and we will look at an area of Sentinel-2 data, and I guess we'll, we'll look at the natural color. And we'll look in an area in northern Uganda. So this is a quick way of getting some cloud-free Sentinel-2 data. So if you're looking at, uh, maybe looking at different agricultural areas and you wanted to compare it with NDVI anomalies or precipitation, and you wanted to have a, a, a quick visualization of um, some base layer, it could be derived from Landsat imagery or Sentinel imagery. This is a quick way of bringing imagery into the Gaddis uh, geospatial portal. It's also to run, uh, possible to run analytics quickly on this area. So by selecting the analytics tool, the extent stayed the same, and then I can start looking at different commodities. So in this case, I will draw another bounding box around this area. And this area by default selected the country of Uganda. And then we'll look at some, some commodities. So in this case, we will look at corn and we'll look at the production of corn for all the years 
and let's make a line graph out of it and then we'll run some analytics. So we can see for the past uh, 60 years that the production of maize in Uganda, especially starting around 2008 to 2010, saw a marked increase in production in Uganda at that time. The same quick statistics can be drawn up from any country that you select as well as the, uh, the, the crop that you're interested in analyzing. But I'm going to exit out of the commodity statistics and I'm going to go back to the default uh, pane. But this was just a quick overview of the, the Gaddis web portal. Uh, we're providing this for you so that hopefully you will come and explore on your own so you can do own, your own preliminary uh, research for a study area that interests you. An example of an operational food security and early warning system is the Famine Early Warning Systems Network, or FUSENET. Created in 1985 by the U.S. Agency for International Development, or USAID, after devastating famines in East and West Africa, FUSENET provides objective, evidence-based analysis to help government decision makers and relief agencies plan for and respond to humanitarian crises. Analysts and specialists in 19 field offices work with U.S. government science agencies, national government ministries, international agencies, and NGOs to produce forward-looking reports on 28 of the world's most food insecure countries. The USGS Eros Data Center works with USAID, NASA, NOAA, and Commonics International to provide the data, information, and analysis needed for the FUSENET project. A link to their website is provided for you to explore more about this early warning system. The Anomaly Hotspots of Agricultural Production, or ASAP, is an online decision support system for early warning about hotspots of agricultural production anomaly, both crop and rangeland. ASAP was developed by the European Commission's Joint Research Center for Food Security Crisis Prevention and Response Planning Anticipation. ASAP supports multi-agency early warning initiatives and provides information to food security assessments which feed directly into GeoGlam's Crop Monitor for Early Warning. Frequent updates for timely early warning on an open access web interface. ASAP provides information at two levels, monthly identification of agricultural production hotspot countries, as well as summary narratives, and 10-day automatic warnings about low or delayed vegetation performance at the province level, plus weather and earth observation indicators. The ASAP hotspot identification focuses on 80 countries. The decision support system provides NDVI and rainfall estimates crop and rangeland masks, satellite-derived phenology, high-resolution data, and incorporates media monitoring into their assessments. From the ASAP homepage, the map identifies the 80 focus countries for hotspot analysis. We can see from the legend, Zimbabwe is currently a major hotspot for early warning. Since Zimbabwe has been identified as a hotspot, we can go to the Country Assessments tab and select the country to learn more. Each country assessment provides a summary, a map of indicators for both the rangeland and cropland, uh, and previous assessments to learn how long the country has been at its current level of early warning. To learn more about this country, we can go to the Warning Explorer. This will open a new data portal where we can explore both cropland as well as rangeland. So for cropland, let's go down and let's explore southern Mozambique. That's currently at a level three hotspot. We'll select the most recent date 
and we'll select an indicator which will select the mean NDVI difference from the historical year over the season. Once we select the province, we can then explore the statistics. We can see that the area affected uh, has some anomalies in both poor vegetation and severe water deficit. We can look at the time series of warnings to see how long this province and in terms of what, what years it's been under this, uh, this level of, of hotspot analysis. We can also look at the different anomalies on the rate pane for the NDVI and precipitation. We can also look at temporal profiles for rainfall, NDVI, and temperature, as well as look at the phenology. If we wanted to explore this province in greater detail, we can use the high resolution uh, link that will take us to the anomaly hotspots of agricultural production. When this web portal opens, we can see it's the same extent from our previous uh, web portal, only we have uh, different parameters that we can use. We're still, we're still focused on the same province of Mozambique, but now we have a choice of different satellite data. We can use Sentinel-1, SAR data, C-band SAR. We can use Landsat-8, or we can use Sentinel-2. We'll stay with Sentinel-2, and we will select the NDVI. And this NDVI will be from the past month. And we'll comp have a comparison of year of 2019. And then we'll click to get that map layer. At the top of the screen, you can see that the map 2 is slowly generating itself. Once it's done drawing, we'll be able to see NDVI for the past month for the province uh, which is experiencing a level 3 hotspot. Now that it's drawn, we will click on the comparison year, which was last year's NDVI for the same month. It doesn't do much to look at these two just by eyeballing them, but if we take the difference between both the target year minus the comparison year, we'll see what values of NDVI are shown. Now that it's done drawing, we can see that a lot of the province is showing negative NDVI values, which means that the vegetation uh, is being seriously stressed by uh, some variable. And as we saw in the statistics on the previous page, uh, precipitation and most likely soil moisture as well is impacting this crop. So to finish up today's webinar series, we'll, we'll talk about the last operational agricultural monitoring system, which is the Group on Earth Observation Global Agricultural Monitoring Initiative. GeoGLAM is a flagship initiative of the Group on Earth Observations. Their purpose is to increase market transparency and improve food security. GeoGLAM's policy mandate initially came from the group of 20 agricultural ministers in 2011 and has expanded to include food security concerns to support early warning for international agency response to emerging food emergencies. They reinforce the international community's capacity to produce and disseminate relevant, timely, and accurate projections of agricultural production at the national, regional, and global scales. GeoGLAM produces two monthly global crop condition reports. In 2013, directly in response to the G20 policy mandate, the monthly crop monitor for the agricultural market information system was developed. Building on the success of the AMOS monitor and realizing the approach could be applied to food security, the crop monitor for early warning was launched in 2016. Each month, 44 partners come together with their own monitoring and in situ observations to address discrepancies and create a consensus report. Each of the operational monitoring agencies discussed in previous slides all contribute their assessments for both the crop monitor for AMOS 
and the Crop Monitor for Early Warning. Building on the success of the Crop Monitor for Early Warning, the initiative is working with mandated national agencies responsible for food security policy and response programs. The result has been several examples of co-developed crop monitors at the national and regional level. We encourage you to explore their websites to learn more about this initiative and the impact that crop monitors have at the national, regional, and global scales to increase market transparency and improve food security. Next week is the last part of the webinar series. We will be joined by Dr. For Christopher Hain. He will present on evapotranspiration and discuss an open access web tool he and his colleagues have created for the agricultural community. We'll now proceed to the question and answer session. Please enter whatever questions you have in the chat box and we'll try to answer them in the remaining time that we have. For the questions that we don't have time to answer today, we will answer them offline and post everything to the RSET website within one week. If you have any specific questions pertaining to specific subject matter in this webinar series, don't hesitate to contact my colleagues Amita Mehta and myself at the, uh, at the emails that we've provided below. And as a reminder, don't forget to submit all of your homework by the due date of May 12th. And now we will begin the question and answer session. he and his colleagues have created for the agricultural community. We'll now proceed to the question and answer session. Please enter whatever questions you have in the chat box, and we'll try to answer them in the remaining time that we have. For the questions that we don't have time to answer today, we will answer them offline and post everything to the RSET website within one week. If you have any specific questions pertaining to specific subject matter in this webinar series, don't hesitate to contact my colleagues Amita Mehta and myself at the, uh, at the emails that we've provided below. And as a reminder, don't forget to submit all of your homework by the due date of May 12th. And now we will begin the question and answer session. Well, thank you everybody for sticking around and, and thank you for everybody that is uh, that have submitted um, some questions to us. Um, we hope that you will continue to submit the questions in the chat box and we hope to get to as many as many of them as we can today in the remaining time. Uh, again, as a reminder, we will be posting all the questions, even those that we're not able to get to today. Uh, we will post those by next uh, next Tuesday to to the RSET website. And I know that we've had several questions come in about when uh, week two's question and answer document will be uploaded, and that will be uploaded uh, by the close of business today to our website. So please visit the website later, and we hope to have that up as quickly as possible. So to get into the questions, uh, I'll read uh, each one and, and answer. So question one, how can we identify different crops which are cultivated at the same time in a particular region from satellite images? So one of the ways you can do that is if you understand the agricultural calendar for the area in which the crops are planted, and depending on the scale on which those crops are planted, if it's you know, if it's a, a monocropped field of a large extent, then it will be easier to, uh, to determine different crop types growing within that area. Uh, having access to high resolution data will also help depending on if the crops are intermixed or if they're planted as a monocrop. That will also help to differentiate the different crop types growing in an area depending on the scale. Uh, if, if crop types are intermixed and they're 
And if there are many different species growing within the same pixel resolution, this is where we get into a lot of the challenges in, in crop type mapping using the freely available data that we have. Uh, this is one of the limitations, again, of scale, of spatial resolution. And there are different ways of, of, of trying to compensate for that, but it, it is one of the big limitations of using remote sensing data at the resolution in which we can use it, which is freely available. Uh, of course, if you have access to you know, very high resolution data, which is usually uh, commercially purchased, um, then that opens up uh, new applications. Um, so question two, how do we use a crop mask without ground truthing? This is a, a, a really good question. Um, there have been studies, uh, and we'll, we'll include those later when we post the, this question and answer document. Uh, before we post it on, on next week, uh, we'll, we'll I include some links on some of the studies that have been used um, to create crop masks without uh, having access to ground truth data. Uh, some of those have used analog, so applying uh, applying the methods used in one part of the world in creating a crop mask, and then taking those methods of applying the crop mask in one geography, and then applying that in a different geography. And the assumptions there being, uh, you know, similar climates, uh, similar elevations, things like that. So there are assumptions built into treating different, uh, different crop uh, crop areas using analog data. So, but there have been a lot of success in doing that, and we'll we'll definitely include those uh, some links to those so you can explore more. Um, so, if you if you have access to high resolution data, uh, this this can definitely assist in in differentiating different crop types. Um, if you have access to high spatial resolution, this helps, and then also high spatial uh, uh, temporal resolution for determining uh, planting date and, and phenology. So that also helps as well in, in differentiating different crop types. Uh, most of the time, unfortunately, uh, you know, we, we only have access to coarser resolution data. And there have been studies, uh, and we'll, we'll certainly share those in links before next week, um, in how to spatially aggregate the area in which you are trying to uh, you know, create a crop mask for, uh, and that's based on accurate data that have been um, accrued over over many uh, years of, of of planting in the same area. And these usually are more applicable to more of the commodity crops that are planted over large areas. But there have been success in aggregating areas using statistics based on previous years that have shown that. If you aggregate it to a certain extent, the percentage of the crop growing within the aggregated area is consistent over many years. So that's another way to get uh, a percentage of, of a specific crop type that you could use for a mask and be able to use to, um, if you were trying to use this for a yield model or something else. But we'll definitely include some of those links uh, before, we, before we upload this. Um, by next week. A question three, I am wondering about the Central Asian region. Do you think products are more biased since there is less in situ data available to verify it? Uh, so NDVI is, is the main product that's used ubiquitously. So it's used in pretty much every crop model that people run. Uh, regardless of, of the application. And so for that specific product, which is you know, derived from uh, you know, BRDF derived surface reflectance, those products have been very calibrated uh, both you know, before launch with different missions and then after launch before operational phase of these instruments goes into effect. There's a, a very rigorous uh, a calibration and validation stage. So the products, the surface reflectance, and as well as the you know the derived products from them, such as NDVI, have been highly calibrated and validated 
and especially with instruments that are flying on a lot of or all of the NASA as well as European space agency satellites, the most common ones being uh, the MODIS instrument, the VIRS instrument, um, you know, the, the Landsat uh, suite of instruments from, uh, you know, OLI uh, to ETM plus and, and, and TM and, and some of those instruments. So, so applying this within the Central Asian region, um, I, you know, you, you should be, you know, have a lot of confidence that that you know the the results you're getting are are unbiased and and can be applied to your um, specific research question. A question four: Can we get the local area statewide crop calendar? Uh, so again, for for the states for the United States, I'm I'm assuming that's where this person's question is directed towards. Uh, United States Department of Agriculture, USDA, uh, NASA has, has comprehensive data uh, throughout the, the, the growing season, throughout the calendar uh, farming year. So they have accurate statistics on uh, when crops were planted, how they were planted, uh, some of the agricultural practices used in terms of tillage, in terms of fertilizer application. So a lot of, a lot of these statistics can be found if you go to USDA NASA's website. So uh, we we have included that link on one of the slides, which you should have, or you do have access to on the RSET website. So hopefully you'll go and explore more and 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 search around uh, on the website to be able to get some of those statistics. And they can be applied to, um, you know, for when planting is taking place, they can be applied as, as a kind of a proxy for a, a farming calendar um, if if it's not for that state already. And then another thing I would recommend is if you go to individual states, uh, all of the states, uh, especially the ones that are involved uh, heavily in, in agriculture have local uh, state resources. Um, these could be branches of the state government where they also supply um, information such as you know statistics as well as crop calendars. So that might be a good source depending on what state that you're interested in. And question six, what is the base temperature or temperature base uh, in growing degree days calculation? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't cover that when I discussed it, but uh, the, the, rule of, the rule of thumb that's used for as the base temperature is for grasses, for cereals, and for forage crops, uh, five degrees centigrade is the uh, base temperature. For um, for those for those crops and and for rangeland and then for uh, for other row crops uh, and and uh, vegetables and fruits the temperature base is 10 degrees centigrade uh, which is 50 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for those who don't use the metric system so question seven agricultural uh, agriculture extensively uses various fertilizers and even different practices. Does the difference affect the models? Um, yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, different fertilizer application and, and especially different agricultural practices, if it's, you know, till versus no-till, um, planting method, you know, if you're planting uh, using aerial, uh, you know, distribution or if you're, or if you're having direct soil contact with the seed uh, as it's planted. There's so many different parameters that go into it. So absolutely, um, it, all of these do go into affecting uh, whatever model that you're trying to create in terms of production and yield. Um, so it's, it's difficult to, to assess all these with using strictly remote sensing uh, methods. So if you, if you have access to ground truth data, or if you have access to uh, it through its uh, a government, you know, statistical service that keeps track of all this, maybe you can use that as uh, as insight into what those the uh, agricultural uh, practices were, as well as you know, fertilizer applied and whatnot. So, um, so definitely ground truth would be the you know the the best way to. To assist with that, but if not, you know there are 
state and, and federal resources that, that might be able to, to help. And one in which we've included is USDA Mass, which was discussed earlier in, in this website, or I'm sorry, webinar. And so you can go to them and, and hopefully seek out some of those, um, some of that information. Uh, question eight, can you provide more details on degree day models for pest monitoring activities and control? Yes, we posted some information that was provided by uh, University of Massachusetts. And so to, to provide you with the information that they have you know, provided on their website. So, so with insects and pests, uh, growing degree days give us an understanding and an estimation of uh, when the eggs of a particular pest are going to hatch. Because they're also going to, they've evolved to uh, you know, to evolve with how, when plants are uh, you know going through their growth stages as well, because they depend on them for uh, for their life cycle. So uh, by using the growing degree days, uh, we can you know you know understand when larvae and and uh, different pests are 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 most vulnerable, uh, and then knowing that information, different farmers are able to apply pesticides at that time uh, to limit the impact on, on the you know, setting crop that they're trying to grow. So uh, they differentiated, differentiated between using a strictly calendar method. And the limitation there is obviously there's a lot of variability between years. And so using growing degree days is a more accurate assessment uh, or estimate of, of you know, when best to apply versus using you know what that what the average uh, is for you know going back many calendar years so uh, that's why they they suggest using growing degree days and we've included the link below so hopefully you can uh, go and read more about that uh, yourself and question nine I didn't understand vapor can you please explain in layman's terms please so in layman's terms, the fraction of absorbed photosynthetically active radiation. So the key here is the photosynthetically active radiation. Um, that is the amount of visible light that's coming down. Um, uh, and that's, it's the fraction of that visible light that's actually absorbed by a plant can canopy. So it's a very specific range of, of light, which is in the visible spectrum. And it's a fraction of that light that is actually absorbed by, by a plant in the plant's canopy. And that is directly related on a large scale to uh, primary productivity of photosynth photosynthesis. And it can be used for um, a lot of studies uh, on both the micro and macro scales. So hopefully that answered that question. If not, feel free to send me an email and I'll, I'll try to clarify in greater detail. Question 10, how can we use application of satellite remote sensing data to allow information about the biophysical state of crops to identify adoption of sustainable agriculture, like improved tillage practices, adoption of agroforestry system, and increase of soil organic carbon? Yeah, wonderful question. Um, the, the way that we've answered it is really more in lines of precision farming or smart farming uh, as remote sensing can provide the information on some of the risk factors before the season starts uh, for uh, crop health, uh, livestock health and productivity. And within the season, uh, remote sensing can, you know, assess the current crop conditions uh, as well as um, soil demands uh, and, and water demands and also the information on the effect of, of treatments and interventions uh, and other events um, such as lodging that can take, take place during the season and all of these can you know guide preventative or corrective actions uh, i'd say that for you know for agro agroforestry systems yeah, a lot of that will be i think a lot of that can be played out on more of, you know, if you have ground truth data 
and you're able to, because soils are so variable um, over a small area that if you're trying to determine you know, soil fertility and seeing how methods such as agroforestry are improving soil fertility, then that would, you know, that would be played out on a much smaller scale. And, you know, having access to uh, ground truth data would, would be the most beneficial. Question 11, is there any site similar to USDA to get crop data globally? Uh, in India, is there an equivalent of CropScape and crop ma masking function for satellite data? Uh, so I'm not familiar with if there's if there's a um, a service in 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 the government of India that provides that, and I'll look into that. And if I can find anything, I'll I'll definitely we'll we'll post that before next week. Um, but but outside of India and for for global, because it sounds like this participant is is very much interested in India. But globally, uh, the uh, Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. Um, which the link we've provided here does provide global statistics. Um, and then also the USDA Foreign Agricultural Service, which both of those were mentioned in today's webinar, uh, we're providing links to. They, do, they, they will give you um, access to crop data on a, on a global scale. Both of those will. But again, for India, we'll, you know, I'll look into that and hopefully we can find some information for you uh, before next week. And question 12, for the demo websites, do you need to register before use? No, uh, everything that we demoed today, uh, you can just go use the link uh, and explore. You don't, you don't need to have a registration to be able to, to, uh, uh, to use any of those, any of those websites. Uh, question 13, can data from the Gaddis uh, geoportal be downloaded. Uh, it so it can be downloaded, but if you're if you're curious if it can be downloaded as a raster georeferenced you know file that you can you know perform some analysis on. No, so the Gaddis allows you to export just static images, um, and they can be exported in in different file formats, uh, such as the ones that. Um, we provide so one of the examples that we've shown, which which they've provided on their website. Uh, so question 14, how can we distinguish between rangelands and dry farming areas, both having low NDVI values? It's a good question. Um, so for dry farming and for, for rangelands, I think, the phenology of the crop can help. Uh, the rangeland land phenology cycle will be consistent over over many years. So if you're if you have a time series of data and you see when the rangeland is greening up annually, then you have an, a, an understanding of of when the rangeland and how to dif differentiate that rangeland from, say, dryland farming, which will be planted at specific times of the year, and you should be able to to see that green up, assuming that the area is area planted is is large enough to to pick up that signal, and and assuming that that area is is planted in a large enough area to that it's not mixed in with a lot of other signals from natural vegetation and grassland that's already there. But with those assumptions being made, if you, if you know the phenology of, of the rangeland, you sh that will help to differentiate it between dryland farming that was you know, cultivated in, you know, in, a, in a field. <clears throat> so question 15, you mentioned neural networks could be used for analy uh, analyzing the feed pack. Uh, in, is there other analysis for agriculture where machine learning is used? Yes. Uh, yes, a lot of machine learning is being applied now to agriculture. Um, so decision trees and random forests is, is a, a big one that's being used for classification of crops, uh, for crop type masking 
uh, and differentiating different crops from uh, from each other. And actually, a good uh, a good example of that, if you if you go to the um, the example that we gave at the beginning of this webinar, which focused on the SAR for land cover applications, um, random forest was used for classifying the different crop types within the agricultural fields. So there's actually an RSET webinar. Uh, hopefully you will go and and, uh, and and to learn more about. But but yes, definitely there there have been other machine learning uh, methods used, and we'll by next week we'll we'll uh, we'll try to get some of those examples so that you can you can get more information. Uh, question 16, and since it's 1130, this will be the, the last question. But again, uh, you know, if we, if we didn't get to all of them, we will we'll try to, uh, to answer all of them by next Tuesday. So thank you to everybody that, that submitted questions. Um, so question 16, is it possible to assess nutrients of soils? Uh, this, is, this is very challenging, and it, it helps if you have uh, you know, hyperspectral imagery uh, can really help in this in this application of of um, assessing nutrients of soils. Unfortunately, there is the freely available hyperspectral imagery there 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 isn't. So there there will be a mission being launched um, in the coming years, a NASA mission which will have a hyperspectral sensor, and there was in the past uh, EO one. But that that is a that is a good uh, indicator. But and you can also do it. There there have been studies that use optical data as well as in situ data uh, to assess uh, you know the the uh, nutrients in soils and soil fertility. So we'll we'll try to post those by by next week as well um, based on what we can based on what we can find. Uh, but we are we are at the hour. It's eleven thirty. So thank you everybody that joined us today for, for the part three of this webinar series. We do hope that you'll uh, come back next week is the last part, uh, part four of agricultural applications using remote sensing data. I would like to thank all my colleagues uh, today, Dr. Amita Mekta, Brock Blevins, Jonathan O'Brien, and Selwyn hudson Odoi for all their support in putting this webinar together. And we wish you all a very good day. Stay, self, stay safe. Stay healthy, and we hope to see you next week. Thank you.